Welcome again to today's webinar, Coping with Upcoming Holiday Stress, featuring Elisa Word. It's my pleasure to introduce Elisa. Elisa is a certified emotional intelligence practitioner. She is an equity inclusion strategist and speaker. Additionally, as a certified emotional intelligence coach, she utilizes varied modalities to support those looking for mindset transformation, intrapersonal and interpersonal skill development, self-care, and confidence goals. She also works with individuals and groups desiring growth in cultural dexterity abilities across multiple industries to improve both personal and professional performance and life satisfaction outcomes. She is passionate about advocacy for food allergic, eosinophilic, and asthmatic communities. Elisa earned a Bachelor of Science in Organizational Dynamics with minors in Emotional Intelligence and Leadership conflict resolution, and trauma-informed approaches from Wilmington University. Welcome. Thanks so much, Jen, for having me here today. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna go ahead and start to uh, share my presentation uh, for today so that we can have a great time talking about getting some stress interventions uh, into place. As Jen mentioned, my name is Elisa Word, and I am gonna talk about coping with holiday stress. There are a couple of questions I'm gonna ask before we actually get started today uh, to get us thinking in the mindset of stress management and coping. All right, so the first question that I'm gonna ask for today is, how has your stress level been impacted in the last year and a half? And I'm um, asking you to, to think about that and to select on the screen and share your answers. The second question is going to be, how many of you have a working stress management plan in place. And I'd love for you to go ahead and weigh in. Okay. All right. Thanks so much for that. It's always good to kind of get yourself in the mindset of thinking about that when it comes to you know, stress management and what you're going to do, what your plan looks like. And when I look at, you know, how everybody responded to this, it looks like for many people, it really increased. Uh, and then some people said it increased, but no one said that it stayed the same. And then when I asked, you know, how many people have a working stress management plan, the majority of people don't have one. There would be some that do, and that's okay. If you don't have one currently, we're gonna work on some of those interventions today. Now, just know that as I talk today, that this is not a one size fits all information learning verse. Some of this information may apply to you or in your individual circumstances, and hopefully you'll find something helpful even if it doesn't apply directly to you, maybe there's someone in your circle that uh, this can help today. So you can feel free to take notes if this is something that you wanna do, um, you know, and then also approach the totality of it with a sense of curiosity, if there's something that's even different for you. If at any time you feel any sort of angst, because I know so many people have a lot of things on their plate today. There's so many things that you're doing and you came here today to be part of this and allow me to be on that full plate of life. If you're feeling any angst during any time, I would ask you to briefly take a moment and take in five deep breaths to be able to get your mindset back to more of a calming state. And I'll do my best along the way to try not to bore the heck out of you and make you feel like you're watching paint dry. Um, and I'll have some gloves and questions at the end an opportunity for you to weigh in and ask some things. And then last, but absolutely not least, I have a tremendous appreciation for AppFed and their education partners today for allowing me the time to come in and talk to you about this. But I really have a huge appreciation for those of you who have taken time out of your day to be able to do this because that alone can be stressful changing and switching up your day to do something different, especially when so much of what we do in today's world is are things that are remote. So we're gonna jump right on in. So the holidays are coming. The holidays are coming. What a magical time the holidays are. When they come around, we expect bells and whistles and unstoppable joy, 100% kindness, compassion, smiles and festive songs and harmony, unlimited budgets, and maybe even a pretty little unicorn or a magical fairy tale. 
well, maybe not a fairy tale and maybe not a unicorn. That might seem silly, but in all honesty, each year we get ready for these holidays and somehow our habit deep down inside, we wait for the fairy tale holiday season that we see in movies or the one that we reminisce over from those times in the past, maybe when we were children and quite clearly insulated from the stress and anxiety and all the conflict and general messiness behind the scenes that our families might have went through to make the holidays seem perfect and flawless and like a movie so that the kids knew none the difference. Now, folks, the truth is holidays can be just as or even more stressful than our day-to-day -day living. And in fact, this slide alone with all the busyness, the colors, everything all over the place is indicative of what our lives can be like day to day, let alone during the holidays. It's a representative of the busyness, the craziness, all the things constantly moving in different directions as we try to get through it all and then manage the stress. And that's what we're gonna talk about as we think about defining stress, we think about understanding stress, and we also think about finding some interventions to help us kind of make our way through uh, to get through the stress that we're dealing with. And everybody, everybody has stress. And according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, if you were to try to define stress, stress is defined as a state of mental tension or worries that are caused by problems in your life, work, and so on, that sort of stuff, right? We know what stress is but we tend to think of stress as either something you just deal with or alternatively something that is totally taboo and you should avoid it at all costs and never ever talk about stress. But life shows us that we can't fully escape stress. It is here. It's as real as you and I are. And there's no magic pill for it. Uh, there's no magic way to make it just poof, go away. But you do need to talk about it and we'll get more into that. So when we break stress down and we really think about it, when I say it doesn't go away, that it's always there, there are different types of stress. So good stress, also known as eustress, is the kind of stress that motivates you or maybe it inspires you to do something great or positive. It's kind of the stress that you might get, say for instance, when you're really excited about meeting your favorite movie star or your favorite singer, uh, it's that enjoyable type of stress to try to get something going, but nonetheless, it is a type of stress and it impacts us, you know, or you could, you know, think of this kind of use stress as what the holiday planning is supposed to be as opposed to maybe what it is sometimes. But of course, that's a whole other story. Now, new stress is a kind of stress that doesn't really appear to be significant to you specifically or important to you specifically at the moment. It doesn't really have an immediate impact on your life. It might be something like, you know, you might see a volcano erupt on the news and that might be a wow moment, but it doesn't really stick with you because it doesn't impact you directly. There's that bad stress on the other hand, and that's the one we typically know, and that's distress. It's the one that we're the most familiar with. And there are a couple of subtypes under this when we think about stress itself. The first is acute stress, which is pretty impactful, but it goes away fairly soon. And then there's what I call the really bad stress, and that's chronic stress. It may not seem as intense um, as, as the acute stress at first, but it does last for a longer period of time. Like if you have something happen maybe on the road and it really scares you, and you could feel your heart pounding and racing afterwards. And maybe you're on to a meeting or something and it's over, but you're still kind of on edge and it's still, you know, you're kind of off that day because that kind of stress has been there. And, you know, but then there, uh, when we think about chronic stress, there are things called chronic stressors. And those are the things that really are ongoing and they're continuously present in your life. And you're on a heightened state of arousal for longer periods of time, and they aren't always managed quite as well. Something, for instance, maybe like money problems. Money problems for a long period of time could actually fall into this category of a chronic stressor. And the real deal is that as much as we know we can't totally avoid it, 
we can find some better ways to manage our stress and support ourselves through the process and the journey that we navigate by even getting support from other people and even attending webinars like the one that you're here to attend today. So we're gonna kind of get through some of the boring parts of this stuff and then we'll get into the good stuff. So if you can kind of make it through that part, I think that you're gonna be pleasantly surprised about some of the information we're gonna talk about. Now, in our regular life, we have what I call regular life stressors the day-to-day -day stuff. And no matter how many differences we experience in our own lives or our communities, when it comes to geographical location, race, or even culture, or gender identity, sexual orientation, or religion, there are so many things that can impact everyone where none of those categories that I just mentioned even matter. Money stress, financial stress, that affects everybody. It doesn't care where you live, who you are, what you look like, how you love, how you live, how you worship or whatever, even how you vote, it doesn't care, right? Finances, for instance, whether you're in a healthy financial space or you're in a financial position that needs a little more nurturing, this can be one of the biggest stressors we face. And it's especially true when inflation outpaces the sources of the income that we get to kind of take care of our personal needs. And then, you know, that can cause short periods of stress for some people, and, but that constant juggling, that can actually cause that longer term or chronic stressor type of thing for others that I mentioned already. And then our relationships, whether intimate with a partner or with our family members, they go through this whole gambit of stressful interactions up and down due to different coping styles, behavioral needs, and all the things in between. And then dealing even with our own health issues. That's a thing too that can stress us, especially when they're chronic, like with eosinophilic diseases and accompanying illnesses or AKA comorbidities that can not only make us feel stressed, but can even potentially be impacted by the stress itself. And then there's parenting. Now, when it comes to parenting, it comes with challenges that are unique on their own. And it's not even to the point where it's just a family by family difference. It can also be a child by child difference or on a child by child basis. So there are stressors that go with that, with the good times and also with those challenging times. And if you're a caregiver of a person with healthcare needs, the daily stress of this alone can be immeasurable sometimes as you balance the needs of those you care for with your own needs thinking about things like healthcare priorities, be it insurance costs or barriers that you might be facing to care. Um, and then as a caregiver, you're also susceptible to something called compassion fatigue, where the stress of dealing with someone else's health impacts you. There's also the stress of being part of the squeezed or the sandwich generation, where you might be taking care of a child that has some needs, but you also might be taking care of some aging parents and you're squeezed right there smack dab in the middle. And then other things when it comes back again, circles around to that healthcare situation, figuring out the specifics behind the healthcare system itself, scheduling appointments, thinking about medications, formulary, non-formulary, you know, generic things versus name brand things are all topped off by this paradigm again in this shift this thing, this continuum of you having to constantly deal with your own needs as you're kind of going up and down this roller coaster of life. So there's a lot that we as humans deal with. And when you put it all together, we have a decision to make. It can be thought of as daunting if we wanted to, or, you know, I mean, you could feel like throwing in a towel, or you could actually decide that you're going to deal with it differently and say, you know what? I am gonna be a warrior in this thing. And I'm more capable sometimes of what I think, but I'm also gonna use this opportunity to get my supports in place to help me get through it all because I only have one me, you only have one you. So life is gonna keep throwing curveballs, and it's really about how we choose to manage it in order for us to be able to navigate through it. And one thing to consider when you think about this navigation is your own mountain of stress as you continue to pile on things that you want to do or that you're responsible for or things that you know you don't want to be responsible for because the mountain of stress it can continue to grow more and more and more and you might not realize it 
until there's this peak and it's too much for you to actually handle. So before you get there, it's important to think, what can I do to begin to put a plan in place? Because self-awareness is key. I'll talk a little bit more about self-awareness in a moment because you can't really know about your own stress mountain if you're not aware that it even exists. So let's talk for a moment about some things that we went through over the past year and a half. Now we know the world has recently faced some unprecedented times for our lifespans. Over the last year and a half, we had everyday stress to contend with, like I mentioned previously, and you know, be it as it may, there were some other things to think about that kind of came in and really changed the game for us. So we started off 2020, you know, just like normal stuff, you know, we get a shift in our election year. We've got some post-inauguration stress, which was followed by the arrival of the COVID-19 train. And then, of course, it was followed by some racial tensions and unrest in the wake of the situation uh, with a gentleman by the name of George Floyd in the United States. And it was kind of like the thing heard around the world with both that and the COVID train happening at the same time. And then we were also dealing with lockdowns worldwide that were impacting trade. They were things that were impacting us on a global scale. And our daily living was really, truly affected. Everything that we thought about last year just compiled, it was piled on top of that stress mountain that we already have with the day-to-day -day stuff. And then remote working became a thing. And all of a sudden we had to worry about that. And, you know, do you have a computer? Will your system work? Is this thing going to crash? Are we able to meet in person? Some people couldn't do that. Some people had to stay working in person at their jobs. And unfortunately for some people, businesses, they, they just failed and people were out of work. People suffered tremendous losses during you know, this whole time period in a multitude of ways. And then even with schools closed, parents did what they could do to juggle and teachers had to scramble and, and we were trying to remain safe. And then there was this fear that kind of now was fully set into place. And then there were grocery uncertainties that arose as people hoarded food and even created what I like to call the great toilet paper gate, right? So, which was kind of like the scandal of how can you find toilet paper? You know, people are actually strategizing. My mom was calling me, you know, I heard that this company gets it on these days and I heard that this place gets it here. And then there was pretty much the non-existent um, disinfectant sprays that we were looking at because manufacturers were doing everything they could do to keep up with demand, but they too, had employees that like you and I were human and who were dealing with this stress mountain in life. So everyone had flux last year. And that's how we kind of got here to today. And because of this, many people even assumed that at the end of the year last year, the holiday season was going to be invisible because it was just too much to even think about. But interestingly enough, that wasn't the case. Though retail sales for December 2020 were down by 1.6% over the sales for November of last year, they were actually up 8.9% over a three-month period, believe it or not. And that was compared to the sales in 2019. And they subsequently finished, can you wait for this, 8.3%. There was an 8.3% increase in holiday sales last year. This was more than double the 3.5% average over the prior five years. And that information comes from the National Retail Foundation. So I'm thinking, what? Wait, what happened? All of this daily stress, plus this cocktail of 2020, the stress mountain that we had going on and retail sales were up. You might be asking how on earth did that happen? Because that's exactly what I was asking. For some reason, one of the ways that many of us cope with stress is with retail therapy. For many people, that is a stress response. Each of us have our own ways of dealing with stress. Each of us have stress responses, but without self-awareness, you won't know what your own stress responses are until you take the moment to sit down and to think about it. Now let's get back into this uh, stress mount. 
So as if it was not bad enough in 2020, we kicked off 2021 in January. We know we had the insurrection situation in the US, the Capitol. But, you know, there was a lot. There was just a whole lot of things going on. And I'm sure the people who were involved in that situation were also on stress overload. People do some really interesting things when stress is taking over their mindset. So let's see if we can figure out how we can get from here to something a little bit more manageable. So let me tell you a little bit how I actually got here today, where I'm discussing this kind of coping with stress. Many of you might be managing chronic illness, either for yourself or for a loved one. It can be hard. It can be a roller coaster. It can be unpredictable. It could also be costly. It can be something others don't understand because they either don't want to because it's just not close enough because they're not going through it, or it's too hard to even think about. Dealing with your appointments, and that can be a lot to deal with. Physicians themselves, they have their own stress. Their offices are filled with so many patients with various illnesses, and it's hard sometimes for them to be able to afford the luxury of personal experience when sometimes that's what we need to even manage the stress of dealing with our situations. Because sometimes we have these fears about things because we don't know what's gonna happen next. I want you to think about your own stress levels as well as you think about this journey and the people that you interact with regularly. Today, we can make it better together, but alone we end up kind of laboring in this place where we're always scrambling for support because we feel like people don't understand us. So before we get into the core part of the talk to get you those interventions, I wanna share a quick story of my own personal journey. So my daughter was born and she always seemed to be sick. We were always dealing with issues. We had a lot of isolation kind of stuff going on at the holidays. People didn't really know how to deal with the situations going with her because she had a lot of life, uh, potentially life-threatening food allergies. And we dealt with that for years, but there was always this lingering issue with belly distension. And doctor after doctor, you know, a lot of these things are more new when they're trying to find out some things. So we had a hard time getting a diagnosis at first. Eventually, we went to her allergist who knew that she could potentially have GERD and that may, may be something that was impacting her asthma. So we got some checks and, and, and tests for that. We found that to be true. But then she got to the point where she really wasn't getting enough to eat. So we had a failure to thrive and we were really thrust into this area where sometimes a lot of people get into where they're really struggling and very desperate to find some answers. We end up doing everything and we finally had a situation where one day she had some symptoms that just weren't indicative of what people typically have when they have uh, you know, eosinophilic esophagitis. However, I had a good friend who said, hey, maybe you should get a GI consult. And we did. Fast forward, we found out that that's what was going on with my daughter. She had eosinophilic esophagitis. And that was a really tough thing for us to manage on top of everything else. I didn't know what I was doing. No one in my family knew about it. They knew that she also had these other food allergies that were, you know, could potentially be life-threatening. So it was a very lonely time for us. And when I look back on it, there was a massive amount of stress on me to not only keep my child safe, but to deal with my own needs and navigate that during the time that I was trying to figure out what was going on with her. And I literally was pouring from an empty cup every day stressed out, burned out, and didn't know what else to do. Fortunately for us, she didn't end up having to get on a GI tube, which I know sometimes that happens with people. And I'm really exceptionally fortunate in that space because I know the journey for many people is really difficult when they have chronic illnesses that they're dealing with. So we are at a place now, years later, where we're managing but it doesn't mean that we don't have the daily stressors, the stress mountain of the last year and a half, and always the juggling act of seeing what we need to do to keep her health in a space where she is not only thriving, but she's enjoying life despite the chronic illness that she manages. So I wanna take a minute because when I tell my own story sometimes, it can be a little hard. And I'm sure when you tell your own story, it can be a little hard for you. 
So I invite you right now to take five deep breaths to get yourself to more of a calming place. So we're gonna talk a little bit about our own unique stress. Stress is universal, but the impact it has on each of us can be unique. For some, it can impact our gut when we're stressed like me. I may get an upset stomach or even a twinge in my shoulders or my back, whereas somebody else might you know, have maybe one of the eosinophilic diseases and, and maybe this you know, could impact some of the things that they're going through as well in their body. We know that there are a number of these eosinophilic diseases and, and comorbidities that people manage on a regular basis. But my stress might be different than your stress. The impact to me may be different than the impact to you. And when we're dealing with chronic disease, sometimes when we get these diagnoses, things can be very complex and we've gotta be able to manage it the way that we need to in the ways that are unique to us. Other things like different treatment methods can cause you know, stresses we're trying to figure out, navigate and get to different places. And then, you know, sometimes we have some well-intentioned family members or some friends that, you know, give you this unsolicited thought or view about something they saw on the news about a new treatment and how you should manage your condition, which can feel at times like they're lacking compassion because they don't really have enough knowledge about what it is you're going through. And that can be stressful because we often have fears not knowing what that next step is. Families don't always understand what they don't go through. And the relative that refuses to be flexible, sometimes they show up around the holidays. So that's why it's important to talk about this now and to get this game plan in place. Because there might be another time where it might be easier for you to manage, but during the holidays when there's so many other things, it just is compiled on top of it. So our own ability to be able to give ourselves compassion can be really hard, but we have to do it because otherwise you end up pouring from an empty cup like I was. So now we, we know this, there's also a need for compassion even in healthcare. It's real for patients, but on the flip side of it, our healthcare system is stressed, our workers are maxed out, and they're feeling it from both sides. There's issues with costs and billing and plans and navigating different things that are coming up. But there's some considerations as you think about companies doing the best that they can to find better solutions for us. But even in doing so, they too are affected by the holiday stress. Many people at the end of the year are cramming in those appointments because they want to get them in because maybe they have a deductible situation they're going to deal with in January but then there are vacations that happen. So there's this big bubble, this big cocktail that happens. And sometimes it feels like what we're going through is like an ongoing battle. And you're like in this fight, fight, fight all the time to make things right. But this battle, when you get to that point where you feel like you've hit it, I call it the stress wall. And we have to find different ways to hit that stress wall more gently, to push through it, or to push it far enough away that we can have some room to decompress. So we're gonna get into some interventions to help with that because I don't believe in bringing up a problem without thinking about how we can find a solution. In the next section, we're gonna start thinking about some of these interventions to put in place to manage your stress and prepare yourself to deal with some added loads from the holidays. Now, since each of you are unique individuals, the steps for you may not be the same as it is for others. It's important to remember that you have to tailor things to fit your lifestyle, your needs, the things that are mattering to you and your health. Some ideas people might have might seem silly or minuscule, but they're a big deal for other people. We want you to enjoy your life, enjoy the holidays, but we have to recognize that we all have different perspectives and those perspectives are sometimes worth reevaluating. We have to reevaluate our own mindsets from time to time. It's a growth mindset is what we call it in my world. And it doesn't always come naturally, but I'd like to help you figure that out just a little bit. So when we think about these interventions, we think about perspective, your values, your attitudes, and your behaviors. So remember I said that growth mindset? See how big that picture got? And you're that light bulb in the middle. 
So to begin working on these interventions for the holidays or at any time for that matter, we first need to consider how we're actually thinking. And according to the American Psychological Association's Stress in America report, it's been made very clear that Americans are struggling with decision-making, every decision, since the pandemic began. And if we wanna reduce the negative impact of stress or AKA, as I call it, de-stress, distress, we wanna spend some time evaluating our own thinking patterns. Perspective is key. It's a key issue when thinking of when it comes to managing that stress and living it in general. And while the human brain can process 11 million bits of information every second through all of our sensory uh, inputs, our conscious minds can only handle up to 40 or 50 bits of that information a second. It's not much compared to what we have coming at us. So how effectively are we reflecting on our existing perceptions? And remember that slide where I mentioned our regular stressors and then the 2020 stress mountain? Processing all of that at once is enough. And then we have the nerve to go into the holidays and we have to process more. So the first thing to do when you think about these interve interventions is to begin by asking yourself some questions. Be curious about you. How often do you really challenge your mindset? Do you react or do you respond when challenges arise? Do you even have time to think about the difference between a reaction or a response? Do your expectations of others mirror or exceed the expectations that you have of yourself? And if so, why or why not? Do you question your own answers at all? Do you do that too much, not enough? Because there is a balance in there. You don't wanna get stuck in a rumination space where you're just so focused on you can't get off of it because that can cause stress. The questions can begin to help you start changing your mindset because they focus on the skill set of self-awareness that I mentioned in the beginning. And to manage your own stress more effectively, you have to be aware of yourself and what's really happening with you. Others can often see it from the outside, but only you know what's happening on the inside. You're the only one that knows your intentions while the world is only seeing your intentions through your behavior. So what is your behavior saying? And what is their behavior saying to you? And on that note, it's also going to be one of those things where you're going to need to rely on when that relative shows up or that coworker or that person in public that drives you crazy and stresses you out. You're going to have to think about some of this because during the holidays, money tends to be stretched. Time is stretched. People are still doing things to deal with the, with the fallout of the pandemic. So there's a lot. So being on notice for yourself early is going to help because there are times when people can really be nice, but then there's some times that they can also be very inconsiderate and you're still responsible for you. So another thing to think about is with these interventions are your values. What matters most to you? Have you ever connected the dots between how you manage your stress and how you, what your values are? Let's say you value something like honesty or integrity or and compassion and family above all other things. How does it correlate to how you manage your daily living and how you will manage when the malls are full and traffic is really bad and things are, are you know, time is, attention is thick and kids are screaming. Caring for somebody with a chronic illness and health condition or having one yourself is gonna be directly impacted by how you connect your values to your stress triggers, especially during the last few months of the year when the holidays are in play. You might ask why? Well, let me tell you why. If you value honesty, integrity, for example, should you, you should uh, try to work with, maybe if you're gonna try to work with some family members on perhaps creating a menu that takes into consideration you or your child's health and you need them to be honest about ingredients and their integrity is gonna matter because those are values. If you've had poor experiences with them or anybody else around those topics, you're going to be with this heightened sense of alert. And when we have with that heightened sense of alert, we have the potential to become a little bit dysregulated. And when that happens, we might not be thinking as clearly as we normally are. And in that state, we're prone to react instead of respond. And that means we might only hear part of what was said or assume the worst about what was said or even ignore what was said because our minds are in this different thinking state because we're already heightened in that sense because we know that our values are being challenged. At that time, we might just lose sight of compassion for others 
they might lose sight of compassion for us if they even had it in the first place. So let's be honest. Sometimes people will only have compassion to a point because it's not their health issue. It's yours or your child's. And that's frustrating. I'll encourage you by saying, even when you are frustrated, you still have control over you and how you navigate it because you get to own your own power in these situations. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is attitudes. Oh, look at the little girl, she's so sweet, peace and quiet, imagining sugar plums, dancing over her head, right? The joy of the holidays. Remember in the beginning when I talked about that fairy tale expectation about the holidays? Let's do a mental check about the reality of that. This doesn't have to be daunting, but when you go into the holiday season with the right attitude, you have an opportunity. It's an opportunity to set reasonable expectations. You know that Auntie X or Uncle Y, the one that just doesn't get the chronic health issue thing, no matter how hard you try to talk to them about it. Do you really want to spend time and emotional and mental labor fighting with them over the holidays? holidays or do you want to instead take your emotional and mental labor and use that instead to find safe ways to navigate a great experience for yourself and for your family? Can you create new normals instead of digging your heels in to what you think the holidays should be like as opposed to what they are? How many times are the holidays exactly what we think they should be? I venture to say probably most times not. If you travel, you can take enough of what you need to travel, take extra foods, make sure that you're checking if there's potential for doctor's visits or emergency health issues. Do all that research in advance so that you can lessen your own stress before you get to where you're gonna be. Or even when people come, have those conversations so that you can lessen your stress in advance. Think about, you know, finding someone in your family or in your circle who really does support you. Lean on that person a little bit during the holidays or have them lean on you. That can make the difference in making an event actually even bearable that you might not even want to go to anyway. And then can you find a way to kind of laugh at some of the hypocrisy? I mean, seriously, we know that uncle this, aunt this, you know, grandmother this, whoever, cousin this, typically acts like X, Y, and Z. Are we going to get angry about it every year and let it stress us out? Or are we going to just be like, you know what, here they go again. Let me set the tone for me. Decide on what stress interventions are going to matter to you because ultimately being upset and stressed out is going to impact you. And remember, you get to control you. If you run across those button pushers in daily living or during the holidays, you don't have to take them up on their invitation to be part of the fight party. Some of you might actually want to go so far as to even rehearse in advance the possible interactions that you could have with some of those people who tend to push everybody's buttons or some of the situations that you could potentially be in. What are you going to do? What is your plan for that? Oftentimes, we don't have a plan for it. So then we react instead of respond. And also here are a quick list of some behaviors you can model for yourself to help you get through the season better. Spend reasonably. Spending too much money can stress us out. We don't need to keep up with the others in the spending game. You're not gonna impress anybody other than the credit, com credit card companies or the retailers if you overspend. And then for months afterwards, you're gonna have to deal with that. Save your money for things you really need. Maybe medications, safe foods, qualified caregivers, uh, some relaxation, a massage, supplies, any of those things. Take exercise breaks. Though some might not be able to do a lot of physical exercise, work with your physician to find something you can do to get yourself moving to shake off some of the stress that you might experience during this period of time. Mental breaks matter too. Many are working remote. Take a few minutes away from the computer and do something therapeutic for yourself or even away from what you have going on. I used to keep in my bathroom a getaway basket under the sink when my kids were younger because it was the only place I could get to. 
There was a magazine, a word search, some aromatherapy stuff. There are some great ways that you can decide to do this. You can do some meditation. There are meditations out there that are one minute, five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. You can go to sleep to a minute to meditation to be able to have a more peaceful sleep so that you're even more rested for the next day. Think about yoga if that's something on your radar, music therapy, art therapy. And above all, pick your battles. Would you really walk into a lion's den willingly in the wild? When shopping, if you know stores are busy and the days are crazy and things are happening, be reasonable and think about the times you're going to go shopping, the times that you're going to deal with different people that you know, you know, because you might, if you do end up in some sort of conflict, be respectful because ultimately you're going to be the one who's going to think about your behaviors later. I know you can't control everyone else. And that's the part that makes it tough. But what you can do is choose in your power. I will not allow them to take me there today. I will not allow this situation to take me there today because I choose how I behave. And not expect others to think or process like us. People think differently. We weren't all born exactly alike. Sometimes that can be difficult when you think they should know better. But we all have a different capacity for learning. People say, when you know better, you do better. But I say, if you know better, you can do better when you embrace better. Teach people gracefully to respect your needs. And if your regimens are working for you, ignore the the naysayers, as long as they're healthy. You know what conversations you need to have with your physicians and give yourself permission to choose what's best for you or your child. Take some downtime. Everybody needs a break and we all get stressed. Give yourself others and others grace. We're all going to experience some stress at some point, but it's what we choose to do with that when those stress buttons get pushed that is going to impact us both in the short and the long term. Stress can get to you, but making a list of what you're grateful for can help you with that shift. And asking yourself those questions I mentioned earlier, those are going to be a big difference for you in helping you with the behaviors. Even when someone does something, is that their intention to upset you? or are they just on autopilot? I wanna thank everybody today for listening in. And I've got some key takeaways that I wanted to share with you. And these will be available to you also afterwards. Remembering what the different types of stress are. Remembering that unmanaged stress can have a negative impact on you. Stress is inevitable, but you can begin to manage it. And these interventions need to be in place because you can have compassion fatigue if you're a caregiver. Develop your own self-awareness and give yourself some permission to decline invites to conflict. Advanced preparation for for different things can help you, especially if you've got chronic health situations. Financial stress can be a big deal. It can be lowered by setting realistic spending goals sometimes. And consider your own stress mountain that you have regularly. And don't expect others to think like you because honestly, they won't but you can do what you need to do and take your power back. Show people how to treat you gracefully. You can do some activities like journaling, coloring for adults, do a stress diary, dancing, exercise, and then schedule a session with your therapist if you feel that the stress is longer term or it's impacting your daily living. Thanks so much, everyone. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Jen. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. It was just absolutely filled with tips and ideas and suggestions. Thank you. It was exciting. Glad to be here. There were a few times during the presentation that you made some comments about taking five deep breaths. Is there any science behind that or things that we should look for as a, a good time to do that? Yeah, the thing of it is, is that, you know, um, when you, when you study things, like especially from the perspective of trauma interventions, we can become dysregulated. And when we become dysregulated, we tend to start breathing more shallow. And when we do that, the, the amygdala, the whole systems, the fight or flight, everything that happens in our brain kind of goes, um, for lack of a better term, kind of goes haywire. And at that moment, various channels, your thinking channels and even your language channels are impacted. Have you ever had a kid that was totally dysregulated? They were super upset and you're like, why are you doing that? And they just look at you like they're a deer at headlights or they go, I don't know. 
And then people get frustrated, but they don't have the language ability at that moment because they're hyped up, they're hyperventilating. So for us as humans, in order for us to be able to think better and to begin to re-regulate ourselves, we've got to keep that oxygen level flowing to our brain. That's why it's important. It's interesting how you mentioned kids as a part of things. Do you find that there are approaches that work better for getting kids to employ that strategy versus adults? You know, the thing about with kids, um, it's really interesting because sometimes you, you, you don't get them to do that right away. But um, I know sometimes you can do things like, let's blow out a dandelion. Let's blow, blow on a dandelion. If they're not allergic, let's blow up a balloon. Let's blow this. Because then you get them bringing in that air and then putting that air back out. Give them a choice on how they want to manage it. Kids get stressed too. Absolutely. I have a five-year-old and I can uh, definitely relate to some of those scenarios you were referring to. <laughs> um, one of the other things you talked a bit about was how important it is to identify your own unique stressors in order to be able to determine how to deal with them. Um, do you have any tips on how to determine which are your stressors so that you can deal with them? You can start by, by creating a stress journal. Um, journaling in itself is extremely important for many reasons. Um, it helps you to begin to be reflective. You think about you know, things that you're grateful for. You start to really think about your life. But in a stress journal, you have an opportunity to write down things about what happened and reflect on that. So you can think, so you can say to yourself, well, at this time I was thinking this and I was feeling this and I acted this way. How would I have wanted to think? How would I have wanted to feel? How would I have wanted to act? And what do I need to do to make sure that that's something that can happen going forward if I find myself in this or a similar situation? Many times we're reliving some traumas that are subconscious when we're doing things. Somebody might irk you, somebody in the workplace. I don't know what it is about that person, but something about that person drives me crazy. It could be related to something that's happened at another time, but subconsciously, you're not connecting the dots. And those things can be stressors. So when you write that down and you start to see that pattern, every time I'm in this situation or I'm here or this thing happens, I get stressed. My back tightens up, my stomach starts hurting, or I overreact or I underreact. So then you can begin to build that awareness. It reminds me a lot of food diaries which is something a lot of the audience is probably very familiar with um, in so many challenges with food restrictions and being able to document what you're eating and how you react. It, am I correct in saying you're saying almost do the same thing for how your body is reacting to stress? Yeah, so we're already ahead of the game. I feel like we're prepared, you know, like even when I think about, you know, my own daughter, because, you know, typically when we fly, right, we usually wear a mask. Uh, for safety reasons for her. So when everything happened over the last year and a half, well, we had some already, so we were already prepared. So it's the same thing with, you know, those who've been doing these food uh, journals, you know how to do this already, but let's just shift it so that you can get it to a place where it helps you in a different part of your life. And that's with your stress response and the management of it. So once we've identified what our stressors are, you gave us a lot of different tools that we can use to be able to have stress management interventions. Do you find that some are easier for people to start with than others? Like where, where should we start? Well, it really is about you. The first thing I say is stress, you can allow it to have power over you or you can have power over it. Choose to take your power back. When you do that, you get to say things like, I decide today how I'm going to navigate this. I like music. So music is going to be my thing because I've chosen that. So for you, it could be something different. It also could be about what's available to people. 
Some people might like going for long walks, but they live in a climate where it's 20 below, you know, and they can't do that. But how can you do something different around the house? Can you create a game? Can you move things away in different places so you have to move around the house more? So it's a very personal thing. Some people say exercise, that's the best thing. Exercise is good for us and we need it. But that's not everybody's thing. But exercise comes in different ways. You can dance, you can jump up and down, you can walk around cleaning. So it's unique to you. Absolutely. Brett was just writing in, letting us know that he wanted to share a tip. He says he goes golfing to help with stress. So he's encouraging all of us to find something that you like to do once a week or a month and whatever you can do. It, would you say that definitely is hitting on what you're suggesting? I do. And, and I think doing things every week is important, but I also think that every day you've got to have a stress check or a stress break. Okay. You've got to have at least to yourself every day. Can't tell me we don't have 15 minutes to ourselves. Well, that's 15 minutes in the shower, 15 minutes in the bathroom, 15 minutes getting dressed. How are you using that 15 minute window? Are you listening to something therapeutic? Are you drawing and scribbling? They have adult coloring books now. So it's about making it a practice. And if you, if you don't seem to think about making it a practice, I bet you schedule appointments. So schedule it on your calendar for yourself. Calendars do tend to run our lives. So if it's on that calendar, yeah. it definitely is more likely to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for all your wonderful insights today. Really, really appreciate it. You know, as you said, the holidays are coming. So um, <laughs> while there is stress all throughout the year, it definitely has a way of creeping up onto us during that time of the year, for sure. Absolutely. This has been great. We appreciate it so, so much. Well, as we wrap up today and thank Elisa for all her wonderful tips and suggestions that I hope everyone will take to heart this holiday season and all throughout the year, I wanna take a moment to also thank our education partners. The AppFed's EOS support webinar series has three education partners. So thank you to AstraZeneca, to Bristol Myers Squibb, as well as to Takeda. Also wanna inform everyone about some additional upcoming webinars in the series. You can join us on November 16th when we talk with Patty DeMurray about self-advocacy in the healthcare system. You can also join us on December 2nd when we talk with Dr. Pooja Mehta about improving treatment adherence in teens. You can also continue the conversation that we started here today by joining AppFed's online community that's part of the Inspire Network. We have great opportunities there. It's an online forum. You can start your own conversation. You can participate in conversations that are already there. You can connect with other patients and caregivers for support. If you're interested in joining the Inspire Network, head on over to appfed.org connections. Another great way to learn more about eosinophil associated diseases is to listen to our podcast, Real Talk, Eosinophilic Diseases. Our most recent episode featured Holly Nodowitz talking about EGID elimination diets. She shared some wonderful creative strategies to make mealtimes more engaging. And uh, some of you may relate to a story one of our co-hosts shared about his mom peeling grapes um, to help him be able to introduce a new food. There's so many different tips and strategies that she shared with you that we hope can help even more people. Um, so please subscribe to the podcast, Apple, Audible, wherever you listen to podcasts, or head on over to appfed.org slash webinars. Another way to continue learning is through AppFed's conference. This summer, we held our annual patient education conference virtually. As a result, that conference information is still available for everyone to take part in. Whether you are a paid AppFed member or free honorary member, you can get into the conference for free. That's right, the conference is free. You can go to appfed.org slash conference. There are a wealth of presentations about a multitude of different topics about a variety of eosinophil associated diseases. So we hope you will head over and watch some of the recordings. 
In addition to the recordings, you can also still go through the exhibit hall as well as the research poster hall to be able to learn more information about what's going on in research and different organizations that are in the eosinophil associated disease world. Finally, APFED is currently part of an initiative for pediatric asthma called Little Airways Big Voices. Earlier this fall, we held a externally led patient focused drug development meeting to help gather information about what it's like to live with and manage asthma in childhood. We are in the final days of collecting responses to a survey. So if any of you happen to have a child with asthma or experienced asthma in childhood, please head to littleairwaysbigvoices.org to complete the survey. So thank you again so much for joining us today and for sharing so many wonderful tips. We really appreciate you taking your time to, to join us. If anyone has any additional questions for Elisa, please send us an email at mail at appfed.org and we'll be happy to help make a connection. Thank you. Thanks, bye-bye.